Hello. So projected here, you have the image of the Italian village where I grew up. It's at the bottom of a valley at the beginning of the Alps. And its close-knit community was very good for me as I grew up. It fostered my sense of health, self. But um, it was an environment where there's no science. Not only I never met or know of a scientist, but I grew up convinced that scientists were different kind of people that lived in a world that had nothing to do with mine. So I think of it as a minor miracle that I am a scientist nowadays. The type of scientist I am, though, I don't get to make discoveries in physics or biology or medicine. Rather, I help researchers in all of these fields understand when they have a discovery, how to interpret data to foster their research. And today, I would like to share with you some of the steps that scientists take to interpret data and to use them to build up their science work. I like to do so because I think they are the logic and the mindset that's behind them, it's important not only for scientists, but for all of us as human beings and citizens. So first of all, let me convince you that there is something to talk about and things are not trivially self-evident. Okay. To do so, I would like to take you through a little journey of the, some of the debates that we have in the press about the role of science, data, and, and uh, the truth. First of all, there is the acknowledgement that nowadays we have a lot of data. And indeed, you can think about the big digital footprint that each of us has. The movies we like, the songs we listen to, the people we talk to, the topics that engage us, the stuff we buy, how many steps we take a day, everything is digitally recorded and can be possibly mined. In addition to this data that it's passively gathered, technology has opened for us the opportunity to explore and measure variables that were completely out of our reach not too long ago. For example, I work in genetics, and it's now cheap and easy to get the entire DNA sequence of an individual. We can measure the expression level of 20, 30 thousands of genes in different tissues in our body and even at the single cell level. Medical imaging, it's very sophisticated and at high resolution, and so on and so forth. We indeed have much more data than we ever had before. This abundance of data has generated a certain buoyancy. Um, there are many people that um, reflect on the opportunity that this presents, and there is the conviction out there that with all of these data, we are going to be able to tackle scientific questions, any sort of question, with much more precision. Um, in some of this discussion, you'll see different degrees of criticism on the traditional way of doing science, but overall, it's a very optimistic view. There is the notion fundamentally that with the data, we are going to be able to get closer to the truth than we ever had before. While there is this optimistic trend, there is also a more um, pessimistic one. That it's linked to the fact that, unfortunately, a number of results published in a um, reputable scientific journal turned out to be unreproducible. That is, when other scientists tried to redo the same experiment, they did not get the same results. This is very serious business, and indeed, the National Academy of Science, for example, has launched a series of initiatives to understand what's behind this lack of reproducibility. And it is a serious business because if this is the case, we end up undermining the public confidence in science. And indeed, you can already see that there is a very serious challenge to scientific theory and even to recorded data. A challenge that is based on emphasizing the fact that theories are not the truth and that data can be subject to different interpretation. This is an extremely negative view, because if you think that there's no truth out there to be reached, there's no way we can progress towards it. So why can we have such a disparate views of the importance of data and how easy it is to get to the truth? It's because doing science is not a simple matter. Let's take a step back and um, rely on the help of people that have thought about this 
problems for a long time. And um, let's talk about Hume. Hume formalized the problems here in terms of the problem of induction. He notes that no matter how many white, white swans we see, we cannot conclude that all the, white, all the swans are white. There might be one black swan out there that we have not yet seen. Generally speaking, we cannot reach a general conclusion from individual observations, no matter how many they are and no matter how thoroughly we go through them, maybe with the aid of a computer. It's simply a logical fallacy. This is a rather surprising fact because that's what we all do all the time. We look around ourselves, make observations and make conclusions from them. Now, I think we can all accept that as individuals, we might not, in a per we might not act in a perfectly rational fashion, but we are certainly not ready to accept that science is not a rational business. So where do we go from there? Is it impossible to do science? It is not, and Popper, at the beginning of last century, helped us formalize this clearly. He noted that while it is true that we cannot conclude that all swans are white, simply looking at many white swans, we can clearly disprove this statement the moment we see a black swan. It is not possible to prove that a theory is right on the basis of individual observations, but it is possible to prove it that it's wrong. So the way to connect abstract truth with in empirical observations, it's through the scientific method. And Popper's describe the way scientists act in the following, um, with the following example. He says, scientists create a theory. From this theory, they make deductions. And then they go out and try to test this deduction. They try to prove the theory wrong. And if they do not succeed, it does not mean that the theory has been proven right. It's simply corroborated by the data. And if instead it's a bad theory, we can prove it wrong easily and we move on. And that's exactly what scientists do. It may seem a bit awkward to think of trying to prove a theory, a theory wrong, but let me give you an example and think about climate change. The status quo, what everybody would believe to start with, is that the, de the determinant of climates stay the same over time. Now, what scientists might try to do is to say, well, do we see evidence in the data that this cannot possibly be true? Can we contradict this hypothesis? And now, when you think about climate change, you realize that even if it is logically possible to prove that a theory is wrong on the basis of observations, it is not trivial. Because climate is such a complex thing that you can explain almost every pattern that you see on the basis of every theory. There are so many variables that you have to account for. And because climate is so complex, let's try to abstract and consider a much simpler hypothesis that still allows us to make the reflection that I'm trying to do. Suppose you find a coin in your backyard. And your hypothesis is that this coin is unbiased. You want to test it, and you think that to test it, for example, you could flip the coin 10 times and see what your outcomes are. You could see anywhere from 0 to 10 heads, even if the coin is unbiased. So where is your contradiction? Here is where statistics and my day job comes in. Fisher was a contemporary of Popper, and formalize for us a way of reasoning that scientists use all the time. He says, well, when your hypothesis cannot be strictly logically contradicted on the basis of the data, because multiple outcomes are possible, what you should do is to calculate the probability of the outcomes under your hypothesis and see if what you get to see in reality is likely or not. So in the case of the coin flips, for example, we could evaluate the probability that we see at most one head or at most one tail in, out of 10 flips. And if our coin is fair, that's just two out of 100. So you are going to say, well, if I just saw at most one head, that's quite unlikely. I am going to reject the hypothesis that my coin is unbiased. So now we got to see what is a scientific discovery. A scientific discovery, it's not a positive affirmative statement, I have found this new pattern. It's rather a very nuanced one. We say that we have a discovery, 
when the patterns we get to see in the data are very unlikely under the current understanding of the word. Now, it's nuanced, and so you can see that it's not something that leads itself well to tweets or headlines or that immediately arouses the enthusiasm of donors. But it's not nuanced because scientists don't know how to stand up and make their choices, make decisions. It's nuanced because they are, hold themselves to very high standards. They are not going to say things that are false. Let's go back to the big data with which we started and see does the abundance of data in our day and age change the way we do science. And in many ways it does. Substantially, it does because having a lot of data allows us to test many more hypotheses than we ever were before. And in fact, we get to see the data even before we formulate our hypotheses. To fix ideas, let's consider the case of cancer biomarkers. Unfortunately, for many cancers, we have very little therapies, and all of these therapies have serious side effects and people react different to different therapies. So it would be wonderful if for one patient we were to know what is the best treatment for this patient so that he gets immediately better and he doesn't suffer useless side effects. And unfortunately, we don't know how to do this treatment assignment well. So scientists are working very hard to find biomarkers, that is, lab tests you could do to somebody to decide what is the best treatment. How do they do them today? Because it's so easy to get data, what they'll do, for example, is measure the expression level of 20, 30,000 genes in the tissue of the cancer prior to treatment, and then see if the expression levels of any of these genes correlates with outcome. 20 years ago, they would not have been able to do this. They would have had to limit themselves to a handful of protein that they would have picked on the basis of their prior knowledge. So you can see it's great progress. We can cast a wide net. We don't have to rely on limited prior knowledge. But testing a lot of things comes with some problems. Let's go back to our coin flip example. We sort of agreed that we would reject the hypothesis that the coin is unbiased if I get to see at most one head or at most one tail. Because that happens two times out of 100. Now imagine you do that test for 20,000 coins. Even if all the coins are unbiased, you are going to expect that 400 such coins will come up with this outcome. So you will reject the hypothesis of them being unbiased wrongly 400 times. You might discover 400 genes that seem to be good biomarkers for cancer, even if they have really nothing to do with it. Now, this phenomenon has something to do with the lack of reproducibility that I mentioned at the beginning. And one way of rationalizing it is to see that if you look hard enough, you are going to find something. If you go out and you look at correlation between every possible pair of variable under the sun, you're going to find pairs of variables that seem to correlate even if they have nothing to do with each other. So scientists um, are aware of this fact. Sometimes they forget, especially when the number of hypotheses tested is not explicit. Uh, but most of the time, they are very aware, and they try to correct for this phenomenon. So if you think back of our coin flip examples, they may decide that if we are testing 20,000 coins, we are going to up the ante for our surprise level. We are not going to declare a coin unbiased as long as I see at most one head or one tail, but I only want to see only heads or only tails. I want to have a very, very biased result. That takes care of some of the false positives, because now this is a very unlikely event, but it makes it difficult for us to find the coins that are really biased. And it also gives us a very skewed view of the world, because now we are going to focus our attention only on those coins that gave us only heads or only tails. We are going to think that they are extremely biased. We are going to think that their probability of heads is one or the zero. And that might not be the case, because the outcome of the experiment is somewhat random, nevertheless. 
So an analogy that uh, might be useful here is that of um, the winner curse in auctions. The person that walks home with the work of art is very happy because they got to bring home the things that they love. At the same time, they are keenly aware that they might have paid too much because after all, they were the only person in the room ready to put out that amount of money for that piece. So when we are very selective in finding out which genes might be the one that is associated with treatment, we are going to get a biased pict picture of the actual role of that gene. So um, I've taken you for a lot of uh, complex and abstract reasoning. And uh, um, let's try to summarize what I would like my message to be. Firstly, I hope I would convince you that the data does not speak by itself. We need a very sophisticated reasoning to see how we can use the data to learn from it and what type of statements we can make. Then I think that it's absolutely true that having a lot of data has changed the way we do science. And we have to change also the paradigm that we have grown used to. I'm sure you also all studied in high school that you formulate an hypothesis that you get the data to test it and you see if you validate it or not. Well, now we get data before we formulate our hypothesis. So how is our machinery going to change? People are working very actively on this um, all over the world and partially also at Stanford in your backyard. As I said, a lot of abstract concepts, and um, maybe if I told you a success story in uh, science, it would have been more inspiring and more catchy, and so I'm sorry I did not deliver that. But I'm only very partially sorry, because my goal here was to reaffirm complexity. Science, it's not easy, just as life is not easy. And we cannot get away with it. If we limit ourselves to statements that we can make in 140 characters, we are not going to go to very interesting places. Slogans are powerful, they are catchy, but they are also very dangerous. So let me conclude with um, some poetry. Primo Levi was an Italian Jew and he was imprisoned in Auschwitz. In uh, the books he wrote about his experience, he recounts an episode when one of his fellow prisoners, looking for some distraction, asks him for lessons in Italian. And so he starts teaching the basics of Italian and thinking of his mother tongue, he ends up reciting for his fellow prisoner a few verses from Dante's Divine Comedy in the Hell. The set, in this setting, the poet meets Ulysses, who finds himself in hell because he did not respect boundaries. He pushed his boat out of the limits of the world that he was supposed to be in. Dante puts Ulysses in hell, but he's very admire, he really admires him. So in Ulysses' word, he puts in Ulysses' mouth a little speech to his fellow travelers. And in this speech, Ulysses is trying to convince them not to go home to Ithaca, but to continue the exploration. They are words that every Italian know because we study them in high school, but they have a very profound resonance spoken from Auschwitz because they remind us that we are all called to be scientists. We are all called to use our logic, our brain as much as we can, to keep our prejudice at bay and to work as hard as we can to increase our understanding of the world around us. And if we don't do that, we incur in grave danger. So the Italian terzina sounds like, considerate la vostra semenza. Fatti non foste per viver come bruti, ma per seguir virtute en canoscenza. And uh, here you have the translation you find in one of uh, uh, Levy's translations. Think of your breed. For brutish ignorance, your metal was not made. You were made men to follow after knowledge and excellence.